Hey, this is The Practical Prepper, and this is your host, Joe Borowski, and I'm here today with my guest, retired Master Sergeant Ken Roberts. And today we're going to be taking a look at REI's top 10 list, their essentials to take on a day hike. And we're going to break down for you what we think they got right and where we think they could make some improvements. So stay tuned, and I think you're really going to enjoy it. All right, guys, so it's, uh, it's, it's Joe here again in the Practical Prepper podcast, and uh, we're here, and, and, and I'm, I'm here with a friend of mine, too. Hey, guys, I'm Ken Roberts. I'm a uh, Special Forces Medical Sergeant and uh, have a bunch of time climbing mountains and doing alpine-type stuff and uh, just basically a lot of time in the outdoors. Perfect, perfect. And, and so what we're going to do, we're trying something new today. What's new today is we're putting out our podcast. So those of you listening at, at home or in your car probably can't see what we're, we're doing, and that's fine. We're also going to put it out on YouTube and Facebook as well for anybody that wants to tune in. Uh, but really, primarily today, we wanted to, we saw an article, I just texting Ken, and I said, hey, I, just saw, I saw an article from REI, uh, their gear manufacturing company, and uh, really sound in the outdoors and really, really good stuff. But they came out with a list of uh, here's 10 things that you need in a, in a day hike uh, or in a hiking situation. And I really wanted to just have a conversation with Ken, who's done a lot of, a lot of climbing and a lot of pretty cool day hikes. Um, I, I've done a, a fair share on my side and some different uh, type of you know, climates and whatnot. So it would be, uh, we thought, a pretty cool conversation to have and try to figure out what would our 10 uh, well, be and where as, you go. As soon as you told me about it and I, I looked it up and started looking through the list, there were just, there were some things that kind of caught me where I was like, that seems, seems overly redundant or maybe, you know, there, there's an easy way to kind of collect some of that stuff together and, and have a, a single tool that does multiple things as opposed to, I need 13 tools to do this right. one thing. Um, and I, I look at it from the angle that if I'm doing a day hike, and that's logis realistically right. my logistic plan. We should probably preface based that, right? On, yeah, yeah, and I should, I should prep that I'm doing like a one day hike. Generally, when I think of that, I think of kind of light and fast. I'm, I'm not carrying a huge rock. I'm not carrying, I'm, I'm not packed out. You know, I, I'm not planning on going out to survive, but I do on some level need to have a redundancy in gear. But some of the essentials that were on this, it just seemed, overly redundant in some ways and then there were some things that were not on their essentials list and then there were some that were in their optional list that were on their essential list and it just right let's hit just, on some of those yeah kind of hit me kind of yeah. kind of weird so what what jumped out to you right away well for me personally and and, and this is a matter of preference guys and I, and I do get that but for me personally if i'm going on a day hike a hike of any kind if i'm heading into the outdoors for any kind of real period of time I'm taking a day pack of some sort because it's just simply the easiest way. Glad you said that. To, yeah, it's that was easy, not start on their list. Yeah, no, it's it's not on yeah. their list, and it's it's the easiest way to carry everything I need. It's it's a very easy way to organize everything I want to carry, and if I'm going to be spending any kind of real time or covering any sort of real distance, I want to minimize my the points on my body where things are rubbing on me or I'm carrying things close to my person. And I don't know about everybody else, but my day hike bag, I it. It breathes very well. I can get it off my body. The, the the points are very simple, and it's crazy, crazy light. There's no reason yeah. to not take it. And it wasn't on their essentials list, and I was immediately like, "What?" <laughs> I, I had you can tease me on this. I at one point had the giant fanny pack. Yeah, oh, yeah. with the two water oh, yeah. bottles with the suspenders. Yeah, yeah. I got it. Yeah, yeah. I had the same I've had one of those yeah. little rigs. It's just like it's a super lightweight. Yep. Just you know your basic basics in the back. Yeah, absolutely. And you can flip it around. You need some stuff. Yep. Like, you know, like a. I'm not making fun of you at all. I, I, I've yeah. carried those and I did them. <laughs> they, they have a place and they. they yeah. I honestly, my 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 hunting day bag mm -hmm. is very similar to a yeah. system like that. But I'm, I'm used to, for my entire life, I've carried load-bearing systems yeah. of some sort or another. So a suspended load-bearing system around my hips mm -hmm. is very common to me, and right. it works comfortably. Um, but still, for if I'm just straight hiking, and that's the only reason I went out into the woods, I prefer a pack. Yep. And that, that's just me. No, I agree with you, too. I, I, I just... I, I haven't used that thing in forever, but it just it clicked on me when you said pack. I'm like, I remember this. Oh, this yeah, oh, yeah. The fanny pack thing I used to have. So uh, definitely something to put everything in, and then any time that I start to, you know, the one stat um, that I, I heard uh, is that of the 
100 people that needed rescue in national parks last year, 92 of them were day hikers. Yeah. Uh, and it, it really didn't surprise me that much because backpackers are already ready to, <laughs> to go camp out in the woods. So one extra night, you can fudge that. I make the joke that it's, that it's land-based Gilligan's Island. Yeah. You know, I'm going out for the three-hour tour, yeah. and guess what? I got the bonus plan. Yeah, a, we're, we're staying out here for a while. Um, but then it's it's one of those things where, and, and you don't want to make fun because there are people that end up in very dire situations. There are people who who end up losing their lives. That, but it's it's one of those things where there are times where it's a matter of someone has bitten off a little more than they can chew. It's a time where someone has overpaced their experience, kind of overguessed what they were going to be capable of or underguessed what they were going to be up against stepping into the wild. And it, 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 once again, it boils right back down to this list where I looked at it and there were certain things where I was like, there are certain eventualities that you have to in some way be prepared for and have in your mind the second you walk out the door and you have to have some plan for that. And once again, that, that plan has to be environment and experience based. Mm -hmm. It's it's like going into a battle with no idea of what the other army you're up against is, is bringing to bear. So it's this, this weird situation where you're pitting yourself against mother nature and everything it, it can bring to bear and you're not thinking about it. It's a, it's a, you it's you a show reckless... up to go into battle and there's a horse instead of a tank and it's, you're like, exactly. oh, this wasn't what yeah. I thought was going to happen. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's yeah. a bad day. Yeah. So have you ever had those situations where you underestimated what you were going into? I have. Oh, I, yeah, I, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Without question. Yeah. Um, it, it, I, I think that it's a, it's a matter of an eventuality that if you spend a lot of time in the outdoors, and it's because it is such a dynamic environment. It's, yep. it, it, it can turn on a dime in a split second, especially if you add in you know, environmental factors like you go into the desert mm -hmm. where you know, people think deserts and it's immediate, oh, it's, it's hot, it's sunny, it's yep. this and that. And they don't think that the sun goes down and there's right. nothing to maintain that heat. And all of a sudden there's a 50 degree temperature change yep. and I'm four hours away from my car. That's it. Things just got horribly wrong if I walked out there in shorts and a t-shirt with a sun hat on and that's all I have. So that, or if you had altitude, if you had any kind of real altitude where you're above the timber line or you're at the timber line, mm -hmm. Stuff can get super scary really fast. Um, and here's the thing, no prediction of weather is going to be reliable. What comes over the top of that peak. Exactly. What comes over the top of that peak. Well, you're talking about an environment that creates its own weather. Yeah. So how do you predict that? Right. You know, because the, the slightest little pressure change or temperature change or a shift in wind, and now you have a or massively or whatever, right? different environment, yeah. and it's a split second. Yep. Yep. And I've, we've, I've definitely had those situations where you're hiking up a mountain, and you're at 10,000 feet, mm -hmm. and the next thing you know, here comes a thunderstorm. Yep. It's gone in, in minutes, but it is there to bear. When it's it, there yeah, to bear. and it was enough to wreck your, you know, like oh, yeah. all your gears totally soaked, you're, you're completely down. soaked, and now you're cold. Yeah. Because the temperature dropped yep. with that storm coming in and all that water getting dumped on everything. I, I'll tell you, the closest I've ever come to dying in the elements was kind of what you're saying, unpredictable. I would hike in the Grand Canyon was one of those, I've hiked it twice. One of the times I hiked it, we decided to do it, went past those signs that say do not try to hike it in one mm -hmm. day. But we did it over the night. So we went, we did like a noon to noon uh, hike. So it was a purposeful thing. You, yeah. wanted, you wanted to hike the hard part when, in the dark where it's yeah, not yeah, dealing right. with the heat yet. And, uh, but we did that, uh, that hike and uh, we got down there late in the day. We actually did a really good hustle on the way down um, and went down the Bright Angel and then went, shot back up at Kaibot. But, as we went down, we got down to the river, and it's night. It was 100 degrees outside. This is July in the Grand Canyon, and uh, I decided to cool off. The river was still 55 degrees. Yep. I went into shock, and if my buddy wasn't there to pull me out of the water, mm -hmm. that would have been a really, really bad day. Yep. Uh, he pulled me out of the water, and I didn't even. So I almost died of shock because of hypothermic temperatures to my body. Like it went through a shift really fast in the middle of a 100 degree heat, right? So I have made the same exact mistake mm -hmm. on uh, Mount Whitney, out in California. It's the mm -hmm. highest peak in the lower 48. And uh, climbed up it and there's a lake about a thousand feet below the actual peak. Okay. And so you're you're at some good out there. You're a little yeah. over 13,000 feet at this lake. And uh, it's, it's hot and it's sunny right. and it's beautiful out and stripped down and jumped in that lake and same exact yep. thing. Water's still 50 degrees. <laughs> and I was like, holy God, 
it's you know, ice melt. It felt yeah. great for about a split second, and yeah. then I was like, I had made a horrible mistake. Yeah. And I come out of the water, and now I'm cramping, and I've got to warm back up, and like it's yeah. this whole process to where right. I can even get back on the go. Yeah, it's crazy. And and, and so even though you predicted. Same thing. I predicted exactly how much the heat was going to be. Mm-hmm. I knew how much water I wanted to carry. I knew the trail. I had the mat. Everything was going on, but I changed something. Oh yeah, I, I made a foolish mistake. I made a choice right. that led to like all that planning just yep. being moot in an instant. Yep. So what, what they have on here, you know, two itineraries left behind and one under your car seat is actually a pretty solid plan. Yeah. And and I would assume that most of the people that needed to get found in the park, deviated from the plan left behind. On, whether purposeful or not. Right. Maybe, some, maybe it was a wrong term, it was yeah, a bad direction. In some way or another, they deviated from a plan or they just didn't leave one behind. They, yeah. they, and which I think is that failing to plan and like leaving that plan with people is a horrible plan. Right. It's, it's a really good way to lack end up. Lack of plan lost, is not a yeah, plan. Yeah. Lost yeah. out in the woods somewhere. I'm not going to add that as an item to bring, uh, but as far as something that should definitely be done, if you didn't I think tell there someone. There's some things on here that should have been an entirely different list of common sense things to do prior to right. that have nothing to do with your actual logistical load of what you're planning to carry into the woods with you. You talk about what you wear, right? So I don't consider like as far as my clothes. So body type becomes a big thing. Like so, I'm a big husky guy. So if I'm going to walk a really long way and I'm going to be transferring through, sweating, not sweating, that sort of thing, I have to start thinking about chafing and stuff like that. I know that may be kind of a gross thing and personal, but I have to think I'm very conscientious about the types of clothing I wear. You know what works for me in different environments and stuff like that. And that's just a matter of experience and knowledge and having spent time in different environments so knowing what works appropriately there but then also you know if, if i'm going out for a day and i'm going to be wearing shorts and you know a short sleeve shirt or a loose fitting long sleeve shirt that i can roll up the sleeves or something of that nature i need to think how does this translate to you know and once again am i at altitude am i in the desert am i somewhere there's going to be a massive temperature shift the instant the sun goes down how does the clothing I plan on wearing during the day help me, protect me, transform whatever into what I'm going to need to survive in the evening? Or do I need to have some other some other type of you know heat with me? Do I need to bring a space blanket of some sort? Do I need to bring, you know, should my shorts be convertible into long pants? So on and so forth. Should I definitely wear a long sleeve shirt that I can that's lightweight and I can roll up the sleeves and by simply adding a light thermal layer, now I've plussed it up and I can help protect myself from the elements in the cold, those sorts of things. It's just, it's those kind of simple little, you know, considerations ahead of time that I don't really consider that part of my planning as much as it is common sense. Like, I I should know that there's a, a great possibility of me ending up being in the cold at night that I have to deal with. Every other day of your life, you realize night was going to come, <laughs> except the day that you go hiking, yeah. and you're like, well, crap, I guess. <laughs> yeah, right. Night happens here, too. Yeah, right? it's, it's the strangest thing. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things they did have on their list that they starred is emergency shelter. Um, and we see, talked that, a little bit about that, That, right? to me, yeah. fell really into the experience level. Yeah. Um, so let's say you're a guy like me who has been to Seer and been to all sorts of survival schools, and has spent time in multiple different environments on different continents and has learned how to I've learned how to build shelters from all sorts of different people and stuff like that. Depending on where I'm going, there, there are very few environments I can think of where I would think to myself, I need to bring something I can transform into an overnight shelter as opposed to I can collect things from my environment and build a shelter. Mm-hmm. So I, I definitely think that that's much more of an experience thing and environmental. Whereas, You'll know the environments where you're like, I'm yeah, going into where the I desert have to and bring, there is nothing yeah, here. <laughs> I have to bring, if I want to build anything, right. i got to bring it with me because there's not going to be anything available or there's going to be very limited resources yep. and how far am I, going to, am I going to have to travel to find them or once I find them, how far am I going to be continuing on that I have to carry them to have yeah. them, make sure I have them Your with energy me. energy spend to make Exactly. Them All yeah. those sorts of things right. are coming into play. Is it just cheaper up front to carry an eight foot tarp with me? Right. 
and those little some, uh, solar blankets. Sometimes exactly. Something, something like that is that enough. A mylar blanket to take the wind off yeah. and keep the heat in. Exactly. Uh, and keep it dry. So sometimes some, that's simple. something that I thought was that, that's absolute. You at, you definitely would 100% need it, and you need redundancy in it. But I thought that their list was a little odd. That in, under navigation, star they had a map, a compass a altimeter watch, a GPS, and then a satellite messenger and or personal locator beacon. Okay, I get where they're coming from and that all makes sense to me, aside from one thing. Their navigation piece, they're talking about a bunch of different things that they consider must-haves, you have to have them. They talk about a map, a compass, a GPS, an altimeter, and a satellite beacon, which I understand the need for all of those and they all make perfect sense to me, but I'm a, I'm a huge fan of I want the simplicity of a simplistic tool that does a lot of different things. I don't want to bring one thing that only does this one thing. And when I'm building my pace plan for my navigation, it should be, I have, I have a watch. Pace, pace yeah. again, pace it is the, primary, alternate, contingency, emergency. Right. And if you're really doing it right, it's like emergency, emergency, emergency. <laughs> but like, so I have a watch that I can load maps to. It has a built-in compass. I have an extra compass on the band of it that is analog. It's a GPS, it's an altimeter, it's a barometer. It tells me when the sun's kind of coming up and going down and I can have an optional locator beacon. It, it does all of the things that they're talking about. So five of their must-haves are on one piece of equipment and my, of my 10 things that I'm allowed to bring that are their, their top 10, the second one of those is gonna be another GPS that does a bunch of that stuff. And then, you know, I may have a, a paper map with me, but the real emergency to that plan of those two pieces, you know, that are electronic in nature, have batteries, but they do a bunch of stuff, is I'm gonna have a paper map that I can do terrain association and I can legitimately land nav off of that map. But even before that, for two or three days before I've taken this trip, when I'm planning it and when I'm thinking about it, I'm looking at the weather, I'm looking at trends and all that sort of stuff, I'm gonna have in my brain, I'm going to memorize some of the you know major terrain features. This is my general you know path of direction I plan on taking. This is these are you know, I should see this. Then once I travel generally this far, I should see this. Mm -hmm. Water is this way, you know, food is that exactly. way, you know, so civilization is in these general directions for this kind of distance. And like, like legitimately map it out to where if I'm somewhere near this, this town, you know, legit civilization, not one house in the middle right. of nowhere. I wanna aim for a big target, big target so that if I'm missing left or right, my boundaries are much bigger. But like, those are all things that are- If I hit a road, to... do I go left or right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and it just, it's the kind of thing where I understand what they're talking about and it makes sense to me. And, and maybe they're coming at it from the angle that not everyone is gonna have this piece of equipment. So here are the things that you need to right. cover all these bases. And maybe it's just, okay, if you have a watch, good. You can check all these boxes and add four more things. Or they legitimately mean bring right. these five right. things. And it just, it struck me a little weird. It, I build my pace plan a little, a little differently and it's just how I go about it. So what if somebody says, yeah, but I have an iPhone, right? So I have all those things. The right? issue is, is that your iPhone is only as useful as the distance of the carrier that it's on. It, yes, it can do a lot of things in and of itself without being on service, but your, you can load maps to it, but you're not gonna have a true GPS. Once you lose service and you lose connectivity, your actual location now, there are versions of the iPhone that you can load a map to, like you can basically remember the map, and it, you can also use it to track distance and stuff like that. So it can be a rough GPS for you because it's, it's following from where you were, when it had connectivity. I use those for running or something. I'm going to exactly. run, how far did I go, right? Exactly. Yeah. But as far as it being a, this is where you're right. at, it's more of a, eh, you're kind of here. So, and, and, and the, a true GPS system, I have a Garmin, I'm pinging satellites. Correct. If I'm using and a GPS the, on my phone, I'm pinging towers. Correct. And getting triangulated. Yep. I need at least two towers or I'm kind of screwed. Yep. And th the thing with a GPS is because you're looking for something that is up above you instead of on a plane with you, your capability to pick it up is better. And depending on you know where you are on the planet and you know what hemisphere you're in, all sorts of stuff, 
the amount of satellites you can pick up mm -hmm. is is much better. Um, so yes, there are times that GPS can fail you basically because the, the levels of cover that you're underneath, the terrain and topography you're in, you know, may limit you being able to get satellites that are further out that you would normally get on flat ground, right. but you're in steep elevation, that sort of thing. But as far as like having to rely on it the same way you would a cell phone, not remotely, they're much more reliable in that kind of yep. environment. Um, the, the one thing that I find that, that is a little different than what people generally think of is that like they think a GPS is, I am pinpoint on this spot. A civilian GPS generally gives you like a like an eight digit grid is basically what it's punching out. And even if it is giving you a 10 digit grid, it's more of a swag than being 100% precise. For those that don't understand, eight digits to 10 digit grid. So the more digits I have, the more precise down to a smaller point I'm getting. Within a minute. Well, yeah. and I'm, I'm, I'm more used to using MGRS, which is a, an amount of meters. I'm putting myself in a box, basically. Whereas when you're talking about Latin long and minutes and seconds and stuff like that, I mean, you can get down to such finite detail of where you're at. But it doesn't matter in what version of you know gridding you're using. Civilian GPSs are only so they're right. only so accurate. Generally, realistically, you're within about 100 yards of where you, it says you are. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're using like like legitimate surveying type material GPS, or you're using military like legitimate GPS, I mean you're down to feet, yeah. and it's it's that close and that precise. Yeah. And I told you, I, I have emotional attachments to paper maps, just maybe just growing up that way. Oh, yeah. But um, in survival situations, there's always some of those things that just make you feel more comfortable um, and, and persist. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's one of those things that for me is a, uh, a comfort item, I would say. Have you ever been on a hike or on a trail somewhere and ran into someone who was geocaching? Yeah. Okay, have you ever had a... a so I've had conversations with people who are geocaching, which for those of you that don't know, it's basically, it's high-tech uh, hide-and-go-seek with individual items and a GPS. Like, so-and-so will take innocuous item and hide it in such a place and, and post a grid for you to find it with a description. And it's... Could be a it's, plastic bucket, an ammo yeah, crate. Yeah, it's, it, it's some random yeah. innocuous item. It's not, it's, it's not about money or anything like that. It's just an opportunity to get people out into the wild and let them, let them do something fun. Um, the thing that I've been weirded out before, though, is asking people who sometimes I've ran into in some pretty remote places, their entire world is based on that GPS that's in yeah. their hand. Like, hey, do you get do you guys backing this up with a map or did you plan it on a right. map and then you're trying to check it with your GPS? And people looked at me like I was insane because I was talking about maps and compasses right. and like actually gridding it out and they're like oh no no, no. I, I got my gps and it's GPS, like good. you realize that thing it, it runs on batteries and it, you know <laughs> it, not, yeah. it, it relies on everything to be working and yeah. you're in the middle of nowhere like i've run into people in some deep dark spaces where i was like really you're yeah. you're out here with just that I hope you got four of those. that's crazy <laughs> yeah. like that's crazy i did for a while you talk about geocaching um i did uh, orienteering the sport yeah, yeah, yeah exactly yeah. where you literally run with a map yep and you find these beacons and you punch your card yep. with a pin, nine pin kind of punch out. Yep. And then you get your bearing and you run. It's a timed race. Mm -hmm. like a, it's like a 5K, but you have to use a map and compass and zigzag all over the mm -hmm. place, right? And you got to collect all your little pins or you didn't win. Yep. So, and uh, they can check where you were at by the type of pin you have on your spot. You yeah. have to have them in like, pin one through six and I'm going to go, I have to have the right pin in the right did you ever do one that was a self-correcting course like you could see like it had the grid of where you were so that you could actually see if you were screwed up or not no. oh, okay. No, okay a yeah. lot of the military land map yeah. courses are it's basically orienteering like what you're yeah, yeah. and you'll have like a little pin punch where when you get to your position you pin punch and then right. you, you move on to your next grid but a lot of them are self-correcting because they'll have the actual grid on the stake that you're at, ah, okay. so you can see if you're messed up. This is where, okay, yep. gotcha, gotcha, yeah, that, no, that's cool. I, I didn't understand, um, like, it's actually a sport, like a global oh, sport, yeah, yeah. like it is, I found out, it is there more are popular. Race, there are races based around more popular than soccer in yeah. the world. I'm like, but around the United States, nobody ever hears yeah. that, you know, or was once upon a time, but uh, no, so I definitely, Map and Compass for me is a, like you talked about, if you have in your high-tech watch, an analog low tech yep. backup, then you've got yourself you know yep. covered pretty well. 
So between to... between my my map check that I did for days before yep. I went out, mental and map. my analog compass, right? I feel comfortable that the worst case scenario yep. happens and everything goes to crap. I can get myself out of here. I can right. get back to civilization if I just know a hundred percent which direction right. I'm going. And, and if if you're if you're an avid survivalist and you kind of do some of those trainings, there are ways using an analog hand watch mm -hmm. and the sun oh, to yeah. be able to help to um, figure out some directionality, even if you don't have, as long as you know where you're at. Uh, I'm, just looking, <laughs> I'm looking for the fastest way that's to right, get home. That's right. Yeah, I, that's not the practical prepper yeah. way to do it. This that, is, that's uh, the, I really want to see how good I am. <laughs> that, I'm testing you know what? Level. I'm going to throw my matches and my fire starter kit away too and yeah. see if I can <laughs> do some friction rubbing and get this started here just for fun. If you get to the point where that is how you're trying to survive. Shit has gone terribly wrong. You have, yeah, <laughs> you have made some <laughs> major mistakes. Good. So definitely navigation. You've got the watch. We talked about the day pack. Um, when I always think of survival, I think of the rules of threes, right? Like you, you, your body can go three minutes without oxygen running through the blood. You can do about three hours in the elements without heat. Uh, you start going, you can do three days without water, right? Three weeks without food. We work our way through those. Um, and using that as like a general framework, yeah, right? Right, right. And everybody's different and all that. But those are the ones I always keep in my mind is I'm, I'm preparing for things. Um, Temperature. We talked a little bit about the type of clothes that you need to wear. See, and I think about it from the, for me, clothes is such a personal thing because I'm five nine and I weigh two hundred fifty pounds, and mm -hmm. what I need to wear to be comfortable in the heat or to deal with chafing, right. moving over long distances, or you know, like I, I know people that won't go in the woods if they're not wearing pants, and I completely understand where they're coming from. I would die. It's an <laughs> oven for me. Like I'm, I'm literally gonna roast myself, yeah. and it just so it, it adds in these other considerations when it comes to okay, I'm just going out for a day. Where am I? What's what is the environment I'm in? Am I in the desert where I'm gonna have to have a 50 degree temperature shift as soon as the sun goes down? Am I at altitude? Where at any given moment yep. the weather can change on a dime based on a wind shift or you know a pressure change coming up the mountain or what whatever it is. Right. If you're in either one of those two environments, I feel like your your capability to be really caught off guard and super unprepared are elevated quite a bit just because of the the dynamic and specialized challenges right. that they offer you. And and when we're talking about altitude, I mean it could it could be as simple as I'm just at the timber line. It doesn't. You don't have to be on a, a 16,000 foot peak or anything like that. In Colorado, there are people all the time on 14ers, 13ers, and 12s that they get caught out, and they get caught out bad because the weather can change so fast. Because you're talking about an environment that's so incredibly dynamic because it makes its own right. weather. And, and I've never done the 20,000, you know, and up peaks that you have. But I, I, my experience of even being up above 10, 12, 14. Yep. You don't think the same way. You don't respond to things the no. same way. Um, you don't breathe the same way. No. Um, so as you get higher and higher and higher, you have to, if you're a day hiker and you're gonna go do a Pikes Peak or something like mm -hmm. that, and you're like, I'm just gonna run it and back down and, and you can, but uh, realize that when you hit certain altitudes, and that one's probably, what's that, 9300 or something, right? Mm -hmm. Pikes, but you're still gonna hit certain altitudes where your mind's not gonna work as fast. If you had to go into a survival situation, that's something you have to take into consideration too. You start to think about the altitude and where you're at, where you started and where you ended up. Well, I think that one of the things that people disregard is my plan, my top 10 things I need to bring with me, nowhere on their plan did it say anything about like medications. Mm -hmm. There's a gigantic part of our population in the United States that, okay, do I have my meds for three days? Right. And, and there, there are certain people out there that they're on heart meds or blood pressure or something, you know, blood thinner, stuff like right. that. And if they go a certain amount of time without those, physiologically, all sorts of bad stuff is going to start happening. And then you add, oh yeah, I'm at 14,000 feet yep. and I don't have my blood thinner and it's going to do super weird stuff to me and now yep. I'm dehydrated. Nowhere on their list was it even a consideration. Right. I thought that was super weird. But it, there, it's it's such a dynamic thing to think about that like, okay, I went out to Colorado because there's a bunch of 14ers out there. Where did I come from? Did I start in you know in sure. the Bay in Maryland right. and fly from zero zero 
and land at 7,000 feet, and then I'm just going to go decide yeah. on that day that I'm just going to cruise up a 14er. Right, and like, I'm in Ohio, so whenever I go out, I take the bus on purpose mm -hmm. as opposed to take the airplane and John out there. Yep. And then hang out at base for a day. Just, yeah, eh, whatever, 6,000, yeah, 7,000. A little, little like, something, yeah. yeah. Even, even a little bit will go along. I tell you, you mentioned the medications. Uh, I mentioned uh, to you, I got in trouble once in the Grand Canyon, and part of that trouble was hiking down, and one of the folks in our crew was diabetic. Mm -hmm. And he went into shock um, because he had exerted all, all of his energy, sugar. all the sugars out, and didn't have a backup insulin plan. And so we were about a mile and a half from the, from the tunnel at the bottom, crossing the bridge, you know, the covered bridge. and everybody else in our crew had taken off, so it was he and I, and I had to run the last mile down to the ranch, mm -hmm. get some Jolly Ranchers that we could dig up in those packs, and run the mile back up the hill, give it to them, and I hiked back down with them, hopped in the river, <laughs> lights out, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, dumb stuff, but because he wasn't prepared oh, yeah. to, he didn't have enough. And it, once again, I think yeah. it goes into that your, your biggest preparation needs to be the realization of who you really are and what your experience level is mm -hmm. and then how prepared you yeah. need to be based off of that your pace plan for everything should be built off of this is what i'm realistically capable and ready right. to do because i have legitimate experience in right. it as opposed to yeah bet on some more and i was ready to day hike that but not everybody in my crew right was equipped so even though i was geared up for it not having everybody and everybody's plans match up can derail your plans. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know? So we've got. Uh, so we talked. We touched on medical supplies. What do you think about first aid kit for day trips? I carry a first aid kit that basically will cover me for to, to basically stop major bleeding. Mm -hmm. I cover some. I basically carry some very simple, um, like basically treatment for fracture kind of stuff. Whereas my idea would be primarily that if, I was, if, I, was, if I was out, yeah. I'm gonna basically have to pull all of that out of my environment. But yeah, I carry a SAM and I carry, I, I naturally have like some ACE wrap and stuff like that. Things that I, I can use and I can turn Portage, into right. the equipment that I need. Right. So I, I can basically scavenge a lot. I don't carry a huge robust kit, but I do carry stuff that's very specific to stop bleeding. I do carry stuff that is very specific for basically if someone's going down from like mm -hmm. anaphylaxis or something of that nature. It's just, gotcha. There's too many unknowns, there's too many, you know, what ifs and just random stuff. And that's one of those things that like- Epis and things like yeah, that. Yeah, there's not a whole lot of, there's there's yeah. not a great way to fix that out there and you're just too far. Right. Um, and I bring a couple comfort items because most of my injuries that I've gotten backpacking are getting torn up by briars yeah. or missed my footage and I dumped out and I've got some good trail rash going mm -hmm. up and down my knees or stuff. Yep. There are things like, I just don't, you know, <laughs> You're basically I don't want to get shit in it, you right. know. You, you don't want to cause the issue that you're afraid of happening by carrying so much stuff. Yeah. But right. you want to have just enough to, for the stuff that's more likely to happen. Yep. You know, if it's, if it's something super duper light, but it would really save me in a, in a bad situation, yeah, I'll add it. Even if it's a, if it's a, eh, it's probably not going to happen. Right. But you need to carry the stuff that covers the most and weighs the least. And it's that that severity, right to likeliness kind of scale yep. of you're trying to plot out the things that are worth taking yep. and the things that if I didn't have them on severity, even though it's low likeliness, high high severity, mm -hmm. it, you ain't walking back out. So yep. Exactly. Those are ones that we want to accomplish as well too. So um, when we go through, so emergency kit, some kind of emergency kit. Um, what else do you saw, see on here that I think was worth uh, worth talking about? I, I did like that they mentioned they they covered that you need some way to to hold water. Yep. But they also mentioned that you need some way to purify water. Amen. And I like the idea that they were thinking ahead that you know, hey, you know. You may not carry enough in, even though you're planning on going on a two hour walk. Yep. But you may not carry enough in, and if things go wrong, um, your one Nalgene bottle ain't going to take you two days. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I like that they covered down on that. I thought that that was great. The, uh, the first aid kit and supplies, the fact that they even mentioned it, I was happy to see it because a lot of people just kind of gloss over it. It's the yep. last, thing, last thing anybody thinks about until it's too late and they desperately need it. I love that they had a fire starter of some sort, lighters, matches, like 
how easy our matches are lighter, right? Exactly. When, when you start thinking about the priorities of work, when, okay, I realize I'm stranded, I'm going to have to be here overnight. Yep. What are the things I need? And when you think about the life priorities, yep. like, what do I need to keep me alive? They covered all those very well. And, and my big one on that, when I start thinking about that, headlamp. That, yep. that is my... I don't like to be in the dark in the woods. For me, a headlamp, <laughs> a headlamp is clothing. Yeah, yeah. When I when I walk out the door to go do a hike, my headlamp's already yeah. around my neck. Yeah, I mean, you could you. Yeah, I. It's not the sexiest thing in the world to wear a headlamp, but it definitely will. Uh, <laughs> it'll serve you right in the right time. There's one thing on here that if I'm, if I'm doing this right, I won't see anybody anyway. Right. <laughs> there you go. There's one thing on here that I is on every top ten essentials list I have ever seen from the time I was a Cub Scout. Mm -hmm. And it is one I probably forget to throw in more than any other item on here. And it's one that is valuable to you in the middle of the winter, in the middle of the desert, that's sunscreen. I already, I was there. I already know where you're going. <laughs> I always forget it. I'm, I'm one of those people, I have two colors. I have bright white and I have bright red. <laughs> so sunscreen, once again, it might as well be clothing because yeah. I have it on. Yeah. By the time I finish showering in the morning, I'm about two seconds away from being slathered in that stuff because I, I direct sunlight for 10 minutes, and next thing you know, I'm in deep trouble. Well, I, I had never seen, I, 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 until I had a couple of these trips where I saw a guy get a second degree sunburn, mm -hmm. where these things are actually like, well, and once again, blistering up and boiling. you add altitude, yep. and things get really was, ugly yeah. way faster. Yep. Okay, you add, are you on a lake? Are you, are you near a reflective surface to where the sun is hitting you in a way you're not even thinking of? Right. Is it snowing out? Are you in an alpine environment? Or once again, the reflective is every bit as bad. Oh yeah. And in such a way that it will completely blind you. So it's one of those things sure. where like the environment, did I plan for the environment? That's that's number one above and any and all thing. Am I experienced in this? What yep. don't I know that's going to kill me yep. or get me in a bad way? And reflection is an interesting one. I've literally gotten burned on that one. I was doing a trek we were up 10 days up in Northern Canada doing canoeing mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm in my canoe, my Grumman, aluminum, mm -hmm. it's lathered up the top of my legs real yep. good, don't want any sun to get on these legs, are going to get hit all day long, end of the day man, just shh, underneath my calves are just yep. grilled, just bright red, yep. it's just, I just cooked it on a solar oven all day long. And never thought of it. Never thought second. of it, yep. yeah, never forget it again, but never thought of it, yeah. Yeah, I, sunscreen is always at the top of my list, like I said, a headlamp is basically yep clothing to me insect repellent but not only that like nets or clothing yeah tell me about that one that, that's always one i'm on the fence with because see i i'm not a huge fan of like spray on repellents and stuff like that i much prefer the stuff that i can wash my clothes in and it doesn't have like it doesn't add an odor yeah um, that's, I mean, in what I spent a lot of time doing, that's for a completely different reason. Right. But the other thing is, I just don't want to put putting that crap on my skin all the time. Right. I don't want to smell it. I, when I start sweating really bad, I don't want it in my eyes. I don't want to taste it. I do not want it in my mouth. I don't want to swallow it, that sort of stuff. So oh, I prefer the stuff that I can wash my clothes yeah. in and I'm done with it. And then that way, there's less to think about. But I do carry a hat that has a drop down net specifically yes. because when you go in certain environments, there, there's no amount of off that's gonna take gonna care say, of what you're dealing if with. If you're yeah. in the jungles of South America. There's there's no amount of bug spray that's right. gonna stop them from doing whatever nope. they wanna do. I've done black fly season up in Northern Canada mm -hmm. and without the buoy hat with the net over top of it, like just keeping them off your face. It's like, mm -hmm. like there's just a certain level of comfort you want. Exactly, the, the amount of discomfort and annoyance it's going to destroy the entire time you're yeah. trying to have right in the first place. Yep. So it's too easy. It's too simple. And honestly, you're protecting yourself from probably the, the most likely thing to really get you in some trouble out there as far as like getting you sick. It may not happen the day you're out there, yep. but it can definitely happen the days afterwards. Oh, yeah. I mean, aside from drinking, you know, untreated Bumble water, right. yeah, Diar diarrhea in an yep. emergency situation kills more people. Insects, <laughs> right. insects and getting yep. you sick is way, way up there. And I think it's something that people kind of write off and don't think about yep. until it's way, way too late. You have to live after you're found, yep. right? That's the key. And if you contract some sort of these different diseases that are out there or your gut is just annihilated by mm -hmm. a, a, something that is never going to go away as a bug yep. uh, in your stomach, 
those are hard ones to come back from. So overall, I like the list. I think there were some tweaks we did to it. I think I think their list was super robust for for good reason because they're a massive you know corporation that sells all kinds of stuff to all kinds of people from the most you know beginner of beginner all the way up to guys who are going to summit somewhere mm -hmm. and so they, they they put out this list and I, I think they do it knowing that people who have a little bit more experience are going to kind of look at it and pick it apart a bit and we have to remember they are trying to sell things i mean right one of the things that's on their top 10 list that we both kind of scoffed at on a day trek was a repair kit for small gear right like i was like what like i there's not a lot that breaks on my they, backpack. Are they just talking about like batteries or like 100 mile an hour tape or like, I, I wasn't really sure where they were going with that, but if you go to their website, I guarantee there's a small, small gear repair, repair kit. They probably cost like $75. Bundles, and yeah. pins oh, yeah. for external frame And it's, frame and it's backpacks probably something and they're, and they're, they got a box of them they're just trying to get yeah, rid of. Yeah, yeah. No, I, you're, you're spot on. I, I, think, I think there's a lot of good stuff on here. I think on a trek, if I'm doing through hiking, I have almost all this stuff. Uh, you know, it, it, I, as I look at it, there's not a lot on here. I'm like, well, that's just stupid. I, I, I understand where it all comes from. And on a through, through hike, I would definitely uh, take it on. And obviously this was a purposefully um, over deliberate, uh, long, super long checklist, but they did then star their items here that were their, their top 10. And uh, I think, you know, when it comes down to it, for a beginning hiker, not a bad starting point. I think one thing that we haven't, uh, haven't touched on and, and, and it's because it's it's not part of gear that you're going to pack or stuff like that. But like, we keep on talking about what's your experience level and who are you, mm -hmm. and you got to think about who you are going into these scenarios. Are you fit? Mm -hmm. Are you rested? Are you ready? Like those sorts of things. Like, are is are you going on a hike because someone asked you and it was just some random thing? Or is this something you do? Did you just meet a guy at the bar and you're like, did, yeah. did you bite off more than you can chew? day one first time out yeah because you're not fit you're not ready you know this isn't yep. something that you're you know you, you don't have shoes for the like there's all sorts of things yeah. that come into this like and it, are you fit enough to do this and i think people highly enter because they think of hiking as oh, it's just walking through the woods yeah my, well, my, my, it can be it, it can right. be just a walk in a park somewhere. my retiree in-laws that they go hiking in the mornings that's what they do they day mm -hmm. hike for an hour or two Go in the parks and or I get it. It could be the 97 switchbacks on Whitney right. that takes you up to the highest peak in the lower 48. Right. That's a, essentially it's just a walk up a hill, but it's a big, big hill and it's a really hard walk and you're going to be really cold if you're not ready. Yep. And it's just, I think, I think it's the one last thing that you have to think about and add to that. Am I ready? Like that self checklist is every bit as important as the gear checklist. Yep. Long before you even get started. Yep. Not every hike is doable. Don't assume just because there's a map for it that you will make yeah, it. Yeah, you're the guy. <laughs> and it could be just the time of the year, the weather that's there, whatever else it is. So be prepared. Do your homework. I think that was a big key one. Mm -hmm. Mental maps. Make sure you have those locked away. Know your points. That's self-triangulation. And have the right gear for where you're going. Have the right knowledge for your skill level. Um, and good luck, right? I mean, absolutely. <laughs> have fun out there. Get out there and have fun. Be absolutely get out in the outdoors, but do it appropriate for who you are, where you're at, and uh, start building that experience cache so that the next time you go out, you can do something a little bit more difficult. You know, building a fire from nothing in your backyard to make sure you understand how to do it, or building a shelter in your backyard getting out water purification stuff and purifying water out of your tap to make sure that you understand how it works and, and that you, you're you not trying to figure it out in a dire situation are all fantastic ideas. They're simple, safe, and effective experience builders that you can then take into a you know semi-controlled environment and once again build upon that and not only build your experience but also build that you know, that sense of accomplishment and capability going into, because a positive mindset is another thing that you need to carry with you going into these environments. And your experience level and your, your, your belief in what you're capable of will be very helpful when it comes to that. Awesome. Yep. Great advice, thanks again. Yeah, my pleasure. All right, tune in again next time, guys, for another episode here of The Practical Prepper. And again, you can check us out uh, on YouTube as well and uh, on our Facebook page at uh, 
NSRI USA. That's on Facebook, and that's the, the program here put on by the National Self-Reliance Initiative. Thanks again.